Hello, everyone. My name is Melita Noel Cantu, and I'm so pleased to be here with all of you today. Um, I This is our episode number two for From Censored to Celebrated. And on this show, I talk with guests uh, who are experts both in their professional and personal lives around the diverse area of sexuality and gender. And I'm so pleased to have my guest, uh, Amy Andre, here with me today. And I want everyone just to see her and say hi. We've got this all working here, we hope. So hello, Amy. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm um, so glad to be here. Yay! We're so glad we got the technology working out. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to share a little bit about just how this is going to work today. We are a half hour long chat show here and I'm going to try to use as many visuals as I can but since it's my second episode I'm still getting it figured out. Um, and so if there are any technical glitches just bear with us and we will do our best to, to get back online and of course we have the, the chat that I'll be monitoring uh, so if you have any questions or if you can't hear us please let us know in the chat um, and you can use the hashtag Hashtag censored to the number two celebrated uh, if you want to share any insights you have as we talk. Um, what I do want to tell you about is why I came up with the idea to do this show. And really, as many of you probably know, it's not always easy to talk about gender and sexuality issues. Um, it can be a very vulnerable topic. I think we often self-censor around it or in different environments we may choose to be more free um, around talking about sexuality and gender than in other environments. And so uh, I was really thinking about what are the ways that we actually celebrate around diverse sexuality and gender and really move from that like, wow, I really don't want to talk about this um, to this is something I want to celebrate and I want people in my life to know um, privately or maybe publicly um, about what's important to me around these issues. So my goal today is to fully witness and celebrate my guest, Amy Andre, as we explore sexuality and gender in our chat. And I invite you to join me in that celebration and really think deeply about how can you feel more celebratory rather than feeling kind of the, the weight of censorship. So. Um, as I said, I'm thrilled to interview Amy Andre today, and I wanted to share a little bit about Amy. Uh, she is the co-author of a book titled Bisexual Health, an introduction. I'm going to show you a, a visual here of that book. She gave this to me a few, uh, about in 2008, maybe, Amy, and um, yeah. it's a really fantastic book, and I know she'll talk a little bit more about this throughout our conversation, but I just wanted to give you a really good visual on that. She wrote the introduction for this. Uh, and she's also a bi health educator, a consultant, um, a writer who's published in uh, the all sorts of blogs and the Huffington Post, the Bill Rico, is that how you say it, Amy? I'm not familiar yeah, with that. Say one more time. Bill Erico. It's the Bill Erico Project. The Lerico Project. I was just not getting it. I've meant to ask you how to say that before. <laughs> um, and and a couple, uh, another really interesting fact about Amy is that she has visited the White House a few times, um, both to present her research with other bisexual community leaders and ad ad activists. And she also got to go for the annual LB, LGBT pride reception that President Obama has had every year since he uh, has been in office. So that's really exciting and I'm hoping she'll share a little bit more about that with us as well. Um, she's been featured in the media from Cosmo to, PS to T PBS to CNN. She's given lectures and trainings at universities and she's a Point Foundation Scholar. She's earned her MBA um, at the University of California at Berkeley. And of course I got to meet her when we were both getting our master's degree in sexuality studies at San Francisco State University. We were in the first graduating class for that degree and she focused on bisexual women's identity development there. So Amy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here, Melita. Thank you. Yes. And uh, if you're just joining us again, my name is Melita Noel Cantu and I'm talking with Amy Andre and this is our second episode of From Censored to Celebrated. We have been diligently working on our technology. You may notice that Amy is a little bit blurry. I'm so sorry about that. Um, we're, we're not quite sure what that's about. We've been working on it for a couple of weeks, but uh, we hope you can hear her loud and clear and we're ready to go. So Amy, let's get started. I would like to ask you about... Um, you know this thing, the alphabet soup, that is yes. kind of called in in the uh, in the um, diverse sexuality and gender uh, communities. Um, what's what's your preferred alphabet soup, and do you have different ones in different places and in different environments? Um, for me personally, I identify as bi and uh, as as a bisexual woman, and that's been a consistent identity. 
Um, however, other people kind of move through the alphabet depending on, um, or in or out of the alphabet, depending on how their sexuality might change or evolve over a lifetime. Um, so I think it's all good, although for me I'm pretty static. Other people are fluid, and I think if that works for you, then that's wonderful. In terms of the alphabet soup, um, from a political standpoint, I think that, um, you know, there are different acronyms that work better for different people. Uh, a lot of people say the gay community. Um, I prefer saying the LGBT community because not everyone in the community is gay, obviously. And in fact, um, the largest group within the LGBT is the B. Uh, studies show that 50% of people who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual identify as bisexual. So we are, um, a, we make up half of the LGB and uh, a study that came out from Pew over the summer added in the T, which I think is problematic and I can talk about why that is in a minute. Yeah. But when they added in the T, they found that the B made up 40% of the group. So when you look at LGBT, 40% is the B. And that's actually the largest um, group within the LGBT acronym. So the bisexual population is a significant um, chunk of the LGBT community. And um, so when people refer to gay marriage or gay rights, or the gay community, um, they're actually leaving out most of us. <laughs> and uh, so to me that's, that's um, you know, that's kind of a challenge. I think that we're still getting to know the diversity within the community um, as, a, as a society. So one of the things I like to do is to talk about those numbers and talk about the fact that the B is such a large component of of who we're talking about when we talk about sexual minorities. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's such an important thing that I've been noticing as I've been reading more and more of what you've written um, and the research that's come out more recently that I, I was surprised at what a large uh, part of the uh, the LBGT community bisexuals are. And I think mm -hmm. that um, that's why I'm super excited to be talking about this with you today because it's, it's, uh, it's such a big number and it really isn't talked about much. I think there are a lot mm -hmm. of perceptions around bisexuality. Yeah. Great. Um, well, given, given that and given your interest in bisexuality, can you tell me how, kind of how did you get here? What was your path? Just briefly share a little bit about how did you get to be writing all these articles and doing this research and getting all these degrees? Okay. <laughs> well, um, let's see. Well, I've been interested in the um, rights and the experiences of the bee within the LGBT um, for pretty much uh, since college, so over 20 years now. Um, wow. I've been talking about, you know, since undergrad, I've been talking about bi issues and bi community needs. Um, when I was working on my master's in sexuality studies, my focus was on bi women's identity development, which was kind of, um, you know, a project that I wanted to delve more deeply into, um, but it was part of a history for me of looking at different aspects of the bisexual experience. When I finished my degree, um, I was contacted by some folks who were working with um, what was then called the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. Uh, about a week or two ago, they had a significant name change, and I can talk about that in a minute. But the task force was working on a um, book, which you you, uh, you have in your hands on bisexual Yay. health and they asked me to come in and co-author that mm -hmm. and so I uh, I worked on that book and that was a real eye-opener for me for a couple of reasons. One, I had been looking at a number of um, issues in the bi community um, mostly around bi visibility and bi phobia. I had looked at the way that those issues impact physical and mental health until I was tasked with the project of working mm. on the book. Okay. When I started looking at the research on uh, physical and mental health, um, I was, I wouldn't say I was surprised, but I was enlightened. Um, what I saw consistently time after time 
study after study shows that people who identify as bi have poorer physical and mental health than people who identify as gay and lesbian. And there's a long history of research on the health disparities between straight people and gay and lesbian people. And what I was seeing um, when I was working on the book was that there, there are health disparities between bisexual people and gay and lesbian people as well. Um, and in fact, there's what I call a hierarchy of health when it comes to sexual orientation with heterosexual people having um, the best health uh, relative to sexual orientation, gays and lesbians being somewhere in the middle, and bisexual people being down at the bottom. When we look at studies of stigma, we see that heterosexual people um, tend to stigmatize bisexual people even more than gays and lesbians. And it's not, you know, an oppression Olympics or anything like that, but there is research that, that asks people to compare these different groups and we see consistently that bisexuals are kind of at the bottom of the barrel in terms of how they are treated by the heterosexual population. There's also a lot of research um, as well as anecdotal evidence showing that even in the gay and lesbian community bisexual people experience discrimination. So we're kind of getting it from both sides so to speak <laughs> and, um, yes, and it, yes. it, it impacts our health tremendously. We have higher rates of um, depression, suicidality, we have higher rates of um, drinking, drug use, smoking, um, we have higher rates of domestic violence victimization. Bisexual women's experiences with domestic violence victimization are um, astronomical. They're through the roof. And this is not something that's getting talked about enough, in my opinion. Um, so doing the book, as I said, was a real eye-opener for me. And um, since then, I have focused a lot of time on educating people about the contents of the book. So I'm not speaking so, you know, pie in the sky, let's talk about biphobia like I was before, but I'm saying now, okay, let's look at this study. It says here that here's what what's happening as a result of this discrimination. It's a very clear um, correlation between the two. And I think that that helped me in getting my message out. Um, and then since then I've been asked to write other things and participate in other projects. I uh, write for the Huffington Post about bisexuality and bisexual community as well as for the Bill Erica project. Um, both of those from time to time. I don't have as much time to write as I would like. Um, and then I recently completed a project on bisexual youth for the Human Rights Campaign, which was very exciting and also very enlightening. So it's, it sounds like, uh, I like your, this comment about the Olympic oppression, and <laughs> but you really, you're not trying to, to have that happen, and yet um, really trying to use this research to show that there is what the effects of biphobia are. And uh, what I'm wondering, just as a follow-up question, um, and you may have talked about this a little bit, but if you could get into it a little bit more, is are there like three main reasons that that this seems this oppression seems to be happening, or this biphobia um, seems to be happening both from the heterosexual side and the lay, uh, lesbian and gay communities? Do you have a sense of that? Um, yes and no. Um, <laughs> on, on a certain level, I don't understand why the hate, <laughs> because it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm like. We're lovely people. <laughs> I don't. I don't get it. Right, um, right. So on that fundamental level, I don't really understand biphobia. However, I've spent a long time thinking about it, and reading about it, and talking to people about it. And I think that a lot of biphobia stems from misunderstandings about what bisexuality is. So um, one stereotype about bisexuality is that someone who's bisexual has to be in a relationship with a man and a relationship with a woman at the same mm -hmm. time. And that's not actually the case uh, for every bisexual. There are some bisexual people who are polyamorous and there are many who are monogamous. But I think that because um, I think that because for monosexual people gender is so central to their sexual mm -hmm. identity, um, their own gender and the gender of the person that they're attracted to are front and center. For example, if someone says I'm heterosexual, it means I am a particular gender and I am interested in people who are a different particular gender. Um, 
if someone is gay or lesbian, it means I am X and I'm looking for someone who's also X, or I am Y, I'm looking for someone who's also Y. And for bisexual people, gender may be important, but it's not necessarily a deal breaker. Um, and I think that we have a, a fundamentally different view of the primacy of gender. Mm -hmm. and I think that that is hard for some monosexual people to wrap their minds around, and so they think of it as you want both, whereas we're thinking of it as we are attracted to human beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> End of sentence. Right. So, right. Um, and I'm not speaking for all bisexual people, I should say that. Some bisexual people um, do really um, uh, define their bisexuality um, as being related to gender in a particular way. Um, but many do not. And I think the fact that there are different types of bisexual people and different ways that we look about look at gender um, is uh, maybe a little confusing to people to kind of, like I said, wrap their minds around. Right. And um, you brought this term monosexual, and I know that there's a uh, pansexual. And so where do you fit, where do you how, how does that all kind of fit together? The monosexual, the bisexual, the pansexual orientation, and is there overlap? Oh, that's a good idea. A uh, good question. Um, well, I would define a monosexual person as someone who is um, either gay or straight. That is, they're only attracted to one particular gender. Um, a, a bisexual person, uh, I would say that the most common definition that's used in the bi community to define bisexuality um, was created by Robin Oakes, who's a bi activist and writer. Um, and her definition talks about the fact that bisexual people are people who are attracted to other people um, of different genders, um, could be the same gender, could be a, a, another gender. Um, but not necessarily at the same time or to the same degree or um, in the same way. Uh, so it really kind of breaks down what attraction means. And then um, pansexual people, um, you know, I've heard people define that in different ways too. So I think I'll leave that for any future pansexual guests you might have <laughs> to tell us how, how they define that term for themselves. Great idea. Thanks. Okay. Um, so because uh, we're here to talk about the diversity of gender and sexuality studies, and maybe you have a comment on pansexuality out there, somebody, um, but certainly if you have any questions or insights uh, for Amy that you'd like to share, go ahead and ask us in the comments, and we'll do our best to get to them. And Amy, you mentioned a little bit about the HRC project mm -hmm. uh, that you recently worked on with bisexual youth, and can you tell us a little bit more about what that was about and what, what findings um, came out of it? Because I know that's really recent work and it's very exciting. Yes. Well, uh, the HRC um, conducted a study in, uh, I believe, 2012, and they surveyed 10,000 LGBT-identified young people. And um, to my knowledge, that's the largest study of its kind ever, like in history. So it's pretty groundbreaking, um, the research that they did. And they found that of the LGB portion of the LGBT, um, about half, almost half, identified as bi, which is not surprising because that's the percentage we see in the adult population as well. So they contacted me and asked would I, um, you know, kind of look at this, this pool of data and um, help them with um, creating a report about that data. So that's just what I did. And uh, what I got from that is, um, so the majority of those who identify as bi are women, um, and the, um, the majority in the HRC study of those who identify as bi are young women. And what a lot of these young women are going through, so again, the statistics kind of parallel the adult population. What a lot of these young women are going through is um, sexual harassment. That was the, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, the number one comment about their experiences related to biphobia. A lot of women were, a lot of these young women and girls really were saying that when they come out, came out as bi, um, they are sexually harassed. Boys in their school will grab them. They're called, you know, called names. There's a lot of slut shaming. 
Um, right. There's a lot of um, assumptions being made about their sexual activities, their sexual behaviors, their sexual proclivities. And um, for a lot of the young girls who are not out, the reason that they stated that they're not out is because they don't want to be shamed. They don't want to be harassed. So the two were uh, definitely related to each other in terms of whether you're out or you're not out. It's almost like they know what's going to happen if they come out. And it was really um, almost heartbreaking to read their stories. Uh, there was an open, there was a section of the survey where people could write in open-ended responses. And they talked about, you know, walking down the halls of their school and having people grab at them and, mm -hmm. and um, call their names and, and say things about their sexuality, all because they had come out as bisexual. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was pretty deep to, to read those stories and to hear the girls' voices coming through um, in talking about what they're going through. And all they did was come out. I mean, a lot of these girls were saying they haven't even had any sexual experiences yet, let alone these kind of stereotypical ones that people are uh, quote unquote accusing them of having or harassing them with. So right. um, it's, it's pretty intense stuff out there. Well, this is um, maybe surprising because it's from 2012. I guess I, I would have expected that, that things had moved around around this kind of yeah. slut shaming and the stereotypes around bisexuality. Yeah, that is very, very disturbing. I agree with you. Yeah. Ah, well, we are, um, just so you know, we're about 22 minutes past the hour and we have a few okay. more questions. So I'm going to check, uh, let, let you, I would love to hear about, I know you've been to some exciting events recently, and I would love to hear about one of them, um, maybe the one from June 2014. Mm -hmm. and, um, and also, what event you've been to, but also if there's some kind of conference that you're interested in going to um, that's mm -hmm. upcoming that people may want to check out. Mm -hmm. um, well, there are a number of conferences um, that are coming up that are interesting, but in terms of stuff that I've been to, um, as you mentioned earlier, in September 2013, I was honored um, to be able to go to the White House and to share uh, with a group of fellow activists and um, bisexual researchers and advocates our research on different aspects of the bisexual community's experiences. Um, uh, that was uh, an amazing experience to know that the White House is concerned about our population and concerned about our community. Um, and one thing that I wanted to say also about the HRC report and even the task force report is that even though these are documenting these really in a lot of ways awful things that bisexual people are going through, I have seen the needle move. I have seen um, a, a shift in the way that bisexuality is is treated, um, and well, that's been, good news. It's been very minor, but it's something that I've been observing over a long time. I think that when I first came to this movement, if you will, um, people didn't really know about bisexuality other than the stereotypes. And now I see little pockets of information coming through. I see more and more. Um, commonplace reference to the fact that we make up half of the LGB population, for example. I yeah. see in more and more places, unexpected places really, people talking about the fact that um, that we have these health disparities and that we're experiencing discrimination. Um, and I wouldn't say that that's anywhere where it needs to be, but the awareness is growing and it's building. So I do see some change happening. Um, the meeting at the White House was the first of its kind, I think, probably in the history of the <laughs> of White House. I don't think any previous um, administration had invited the bi community specifically to come and talk about our issues. So that was pretty groundbreaking. Um, when the HRC released the report on bisexual youth, uh, they held an event in conjunction with that, and that was a wonderful opportunity to talk to the community about the research and about the work. Um, and then coming up in the future, the task force, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they recently changed their name. They were the National Gay Lesbian Task Force, and now they're the National LGBTQ Task Force, and so now they're including the B, the T, and the Q in their name, which is wonderful. Um, but they have a conference every year called Creating Change, and that's coming up, I believe, 
January or February. I don't know the exact dates, but you can go to creatingchange.org and you'll be able to see when that's happening. I'm hoping to be able to go to that conference to talk about the HRC report, but that is at this point very up in the air. I don't know if I'll be able to attend, but my hope is that um, someone from the HRC, from the Human Rights Campaign, will be able to attend and talk about the report because it is pretty groundbreaking. Well, and I know that at the Gender Spectrum Conference, I was at in July in California, they, we, there was somebody who presented the HRC report, and it was fascinating to, to hear more about it. And I'm sure that every, every conference that can will be using that data, um, and there's a lot to mine in that data, from my yes. understanding. They haven't even uh, kind of scratched the surface of all that we can learn from it, because it was 10,000 youth being surveyed. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, big deal. So, yes. fantastic. Well, um, Speaking of kind of invisibility and erasure, and you've seen kind of some minor changes and, and improvements around uh, pockets of people maybe knowing more and ha knowing that stat around uh, bisexual people making up half of the LBGTQ community, what, what's a time where either personally or professionally, uh, what's an example where you really felt like you were able to move from feeling censored either by yourself or culturally um, to feeling celebratory? around mm -hmm. bisexuality or, or anything along the diverse gender and sexuality spectrum? Well, um, I'll preface this by saying I love the task force and I think that they do amazing work. Um, but I think that I, the name change was a long time coming and um, it, I mean I feel like I'm glad they did it but I also feel like they it's something that should have happened a long time ago. And I know that there were bi activists and, and probably trans activists as well who were who were advocating for it. And um, so while I'm very excited that they are now um, explicitly including us in the name of their organization, I have felt like there was some bi erasure and of course trans erasure going on. Um, for a long time, given the fact that they were leaving us out. And again, just the B alone, making up half of the LGB, I mean, if you're going to call yourselves the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, or, I mean, you can think of lots of organizations that are right. just the Gay and Lesbian this, or the Gay that. If you're leaving out the B, you're leaving out up to half of the people that you're talking about. And um, yes. that's not just leaving us out, but that's leaving out potential donors. I mean, not all of us have money, but some people do. Right. And um, you know, I mean, I know how nonprofits are run, and and they have to think about their bottom line. And one way to sure. think about your bottom line is to look at what's in your masthead, and are you including all the people that you say you're including? Um, and when you do, those people step up to the plate, and they support you financially and in other ways. So. There are lots of reasons to include the B, not just our numbers, but our dollars, um, what little we have. Um, and another reason is if you're a service organization in particular, if you're a LGBT service organization and you're leaving out the B or leaving out the B and the T, there may be a lot of people who could benefit from your services mm -hmm. who are not aware of the fact that you will be inclusive of them when they walk in the door. Um, because you are not naming them in the name of your organization, so I think there's a lot that um, there's a lot that gets missed when organizations don't name us. Um, and I'm really glad that they're naming us now. I think that's a really important political move. Um, and I kind of wish they had done it before, but I'm glad they've done it now. So I guess it's a both and, which is a perfect by statement to make. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. No. I, I really, I really hear you in that. It's um, it, it kind of seems like by not naming the the B in in for these organizations, it was really just complete invisibility and erasure yes. of the fact that this is such a large piece of the, as you said, it's fifty percent of the LGB. Yes. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So that's a very powerful statistic, and of course, the dollars are important. So yeah. I, I really hear you on that. Well, we're right at the um, half an hour, so I just want to wrap up with my last question. Do you have a few minutes so we can wrap it up? Sure. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I uh, just want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, so tell me about somebody who inspires you uh, around this work and, and, and why. 
Mm -hmm. um, well, one person who inspires me is Audrey Lord, and I think you have her book there. I do, I do. I was so oh. excited. I found my <laughs> copy. I couldn't find it for a little while. Uh, <laughs> she is. She, she was a um, black lesbian poet and writer and activist and advocate. Um, and um, unfortunately, she's no longer with us, but one of the things that she said um, was her quote about the master's tools. She said, they will not dismantle the master's house. So that is something that I've thought about a lot. If, if that's not going to dismantle the house, then what are the tools that will? And I think as activists and as advocates um, for LGBT rights or for whatever we're for, we need to um, we need to come up with those tools. I think the tools are within us. I'm still trying to figure out what they are. Right. Um, yes. But I think you can't just go into it kind of willy nilly. You have to be focused and you have to have a, a strategy and a game plan and know what those tools are going to be. Um, and how you're going to use them because um, she also talked a lot about power and I think that we are we are very powerful we're ultimately powerful um, because we are trying to you know promote not just LGBT rights but human rights in general and the right for anyone to be a sexual person in whatever way they choose to be and I think that that's the thing that's going to change the world I totally agree. Wow, very powerful. Thank you. Um, and it just it just occurred to me with the human rights campaign, they haven't had this issue around what letters to include because they just said human rights from the beginning. Yes, that's and true. And that that's seems true. kind of uh, like they they had the right idea <laughs> from the that's beginning. That's true. That's and a good point. It, that had never occurred to me before. And again, you know, it, it um, you never know how much in terms of actual policy and the work they're doing. Right. Hopefully, they're inclusive around all human rights, but. Um, but I, I think it's great that the language is powerful there too, and and it shows you what a powerful tool language is in general. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, the time always goes too fast. I know. I know. I'm so, so glad we get to talk, Melita. Thank yeah, you for having me. This was so interesting, and um, I really enjoyed hearing all of your comments and your thoughts. And I look forward to hearing what folks out in our audience are thinking and talking about. I know. Uh, some people weren't able to make it on a Friday, so they may be watching this on replay, so I hope they join the conversation later. Okay. And uh, until we meet again for our next Censored to Celebrated, which for me will be on November 22nd with my guest sexuality educator, Remy Newman, um, I am able to connect on Google+, Plus, Twitter, and Facebook, um, and there's also a DSG private community, which I think I've shared with you, Amy, and mm -hmm. is folks who want to connect around diverse sexuality and gender issues um, and who are working in this field. And so it's a private community just for those folks. You, um, I'm the moderator. And just come and chat with us. It's a, it's a great place to kind of talk more in depth about these. And I didn't find a group like this, so I created one. Um, and you can request a rec uh, an invite from me by going to my About section. So we'll also be fo posting the full video with Amy. And here she is again. Amy, Andre, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and we'll also be putting together a video clip of just a, a little highlight of our favorite part of our discussion. So be on the lookout for that. And do save the date for November 22nd. Um, and in the meantime, uh, so much gratitude to everyone for joining us. So much gratitude to Amy Andre for joining us. You can find her at amyandre.com. Amy, is there anywhere else they should be looking for you? Um, nope, that's about it. Thank That's you. about it. Okay, and of course you have links to all your articles and things and blogs there, which is great. And um, I just wish all of you so much celebration in your life and that you get a chance to celebrate all the people in your life until we meet again. Thanks again. <laughs>